Welcome to the Big Water Podcast. I am Ross Roberts, and you know, fishing is what I do, but we also like to talk about it. And we've got one of my buddies, he's already laughing, so we know that this is going to be a good deal, because when you've got a guy that you started fishing with when you were, basically, I think the umbilical cord was still attached, he's probably going to have some stories, good and bad, but I'd like to welcome Todd Frank, Plast Guy, New York, a longtime friend and fishing comrade, I don't even know what you'd call us, probably, a, maybe an acquaintance, I don't know if we want to go friend. We don't want to go friends, but... Long time no see, actually. It seems like, you know, unfortunately, now that you will we'll get into how I met you and some of the old school stuff, but um, now that you're kind of a road warrior doing some of that repping stuff and I'm kind of doing my thing, you know, it's it seems like we just run into each other at trade shows and different events and stuff, and it's a lot different than, uh, than it used to be, for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, we see each other quite often, you know, back years ago when when we were all over the place, but, uh, you know, at least we're all still in the industry now, and uh, we do catch up now and every now and again. I mean, it's, it's it's hard to believe, but, you know, I mean, I was really young. You were younger, right? I mean, it's over 20 years ago that, that you know, some of the stuff came together, and then professional fishing, the professional walleye trail, all that stuff. It's, uh, things have changed a lot. I don't think you even had a driver's license back then. I literally, it's funny you say that because you remember when I was fishing with Roach, I literally had, I had to drive his boat. I, I've got a funny story. I don't know if you remember, but yeah, I was driving the boat. People are like, who's that driving Roach's boat? A little, little Opie over there. But I want to, I want to start with a story because people love stories and I'm sure you got a couple and this one's going to make us both look bad. Just so you know, I'm just warning you. <laughs> Cleveland, Ohio, Home Depot. Do you remember? <laughs> I think keep going. So we're in your suburban, and you had just um, changed life, shall we say, some things, right? Some family stuff, and me and you are there. I'm. I think I was in college at the time. I think, and there was a chick that was walking through the uh, the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know where I'm going with this? Oh yeah, yeah. And old Gary Roach, we call him Papa. I don't think I've called him Gary in 20 years. So here's comes no. Papa out. Now he sees me and you through. We're I, we're both in your truck. And I'm in the passenger seat, you're driving in the Suburban, and we're like pulling up kind of to get, pick up Papa. He comes out with paint, which we'll get into that too, why we needed the paint. Uh, <laughs> there's just, there's so many things, but, so me and you were sitting there, and there was a, a, a younger lady that was, she was not, um, not hard on the eyes, right? And she was sitting in her car, I can't remember what she was doing or whatever, I don't know that we ever knew, but, so Roach sees us like oogling from the car, and he kind of does one of these, you know? And he goes over to the car, and he starts talking to her. He gets in the back seat of the Suburban, and he goes, Her name's Angela, and if you guys weren't such pussies, you could have got her number. She's single. <laughs> and I have no clue what her name was. But me and you are just looking. Here's old white hair, Papa Roach. At the time, he, he looked like he was 90 then, you know. He, he's yeah. always the, had the gray hair, the, the silver fox. But, and me and you are just looking at each other, and he just, we're like, man, we got taken by Papa again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it, and we can go on and on about stories about him. He's uh, he's quite a character for sure. He's a legend. He is a living uh, legend is. for sure. And and that's how I think that I got to know you was you know he kind of took you under his wing, right? Um, he he did. Yeah, I met him, uh, and, and it was it was funny. I met him while I was on the tour, and um, we were out in South Dakota fishing a derby in uh, Pierce, South Dakota, and you know I knew him. To where you know if you go in a, if you're in one of those places where we're having a, a tournament or something you go in a gas station and you know you'd see Gary Roach well Gary Roach you know if you're a walleye guy back especially in those days you know Gary Roach he's he's the king well, um, I mean and, he was, and so let's let's even stop there like the kids nowadays because I say all the time people say hey who helped you and I go you know Gary Roach and they're like really who because the young yeah. guys you know what I mean they're so far past that but like when me and you were traveling with him there was cardboard cutouts in the gas stations. He yeah. had his own series of boats with Lund, the Mr. Walleye series. He had his own series of rods. Had, I mean, everything. He was like the KVD of multi-species fishing. Right. Yeah, he was the icon for sure um, in those days. And, you know, still to this day, not so much the younger guys because he's not um, as active as he used to be. Um, but still the older guys, you talked to him about Gary Roach. Oh, yeah, Mr. Walleye. Right. Yeah. Everybody's got a Gary story. Yeah, everybody's got a Gary story. And if story. it's a really good Gary story, it, it starts with, hey, rotten. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's going back even further, yeah. You talk to some of those guys. But anyway, so you're in a gas station out there. Yeah, so, I, you know, 
I would see Gary come in and he would always talk. That was one thing that, about Gary Roach and all the years that I traveled with him is he would talk to anybody and everybody and, you know, share a fish story or what have you. That was one of the things that I always envied about him. Um, but so that was how I knew him. Um, he didn't know my name. Of course, I knew his. We were down in South Dakota fishing a tournament in Pierce, South Dakota. Um, and he had just had heart surgery maybe a couple of months before that. This isn't the and, word that he ended up on the dock, is it? Yeah. This is how I met him. I mean, truly met him. And he didn't really know me from anybody. But those guys, there was about 40 guys fishing about 40 to 50 miles downstream uh, up here South Dakota and the wind come up really bad you know 40 50 mile an hour winds um, there was two guys that made it back that day um, the rest of them stayed down there uh, one of them was Gary Roach and the other one was uh, was uh, Mike Gofron well Gary had just had open heart surgery two months prior to that and I remember I, I was standing there because I have another story about that whole tournament but when I was stuck in the mud but um, <laughs> The tow truck, the tow truck story. So I, I happened to be standing on down by the dock that day. I watched Gary pull in, and boy, I tell you what, he looked horrible. So <clears throat> I went down to the dock there, and and I said, Gary, you all right? He goes, No. He goes, I'm not all right. And uh, he says, uh, I got to eat something. I go, Well, listen, give me your fish. I mean, he could hardly walk. So I said, Give me your fish. I'll take them to the scales for you. You get inside the PWT trailer. So that's what he did. He handed his fish off to me. Like I say, you don't know me from a bag of apples other than I'll maybe. I'll tell you what, he must have been in bad shape because the papa I know ain't going to do that. He would never do that. Exactly. So, and I go, when he was walking up, I said, so give me the keys to your truck and I'll load your boat up for you. And he just reached in his pocket and handed me his keys. And he says, in that parking lot. So I took his fish to the scales for him. I grabbed uh, Mark Quartz. And we went over, grabbed his truck, loaded his boat for him, and I brought the keys back to you. I said, your truck's in the parking lot, your boat's all loaded, here's your keys. And, um, you know, by that time he was coming around a little bit, and uh, he was getting warmed up. He says, oh, I thank you for that, blah, blah, blah. So that was the end of that deal. I get home from that tournament, and I get a phone call, and it's Gary Roach. And uh, he says, oh, I just wanted to thank you for... Uh, for load my truck up he said i was in pretty rough shape that day and um all that stuff and he goes oh by the way he says uh uh i need somebody to i need somebody to uh, room with on these tournaments i don't know this guy from a bag of apples other than he's mr walleye and he goes how about the next tournament you, yeah, you this and is I like go? michael jordan saying hey yeah. i need a roomie <laughs> yeah yeah exactly he goes how about the next tournament you and i room together <laughs> i'm thinking this is Gary Roach calling me. He wants me to share a room with him. Jackpot. <laughs> so, and he goes in, and I have a team called Mr. Walleye Specialties that he says, I'd kind of like a guy from the out in the uh, Northeast. And he said, we're a promotional company, and, you know, we have all these sponsors, and we do different things. And, and uh, he said, would you be interested in that? I go, yeah, yeah. I said, I'll, I'll try that. So we did. Two weeks later, we met up. And um, what, what year been, roughly is this? This is about 2000, 99 or 2000. And uh, he goes, I'd been watching you because um, I had been on the tour a year before that. I actually worked by myself and stuff. But um, uh, he said, I'd been watching you. So anyway, we did that. And the rest is history. Uh, he and I become like father and son after that. I toured the whole rest of my career with him. Um, and, you know, you've seen us together for years. And still to this day, I talk to Roach normally at least once a week. Um, so, you know, we've we've kept in contact. And uh, it was a pretty cool relationship. And it was pretty cool how I met the guy. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it pretty special. I think what's pretty special is that you brought up, I wasn't even going to go there, but I have a picture somewhere, because back when I was working with the Wall Insider, of your boat up in the uh, in the trees or the mud bank there. Oh, that was that tournament. Yeah, that's... And uh, that's a story. We in New York no more. <laughs> you know, you go fish a tournament and you have to come, you have to get your boat towed out with a wrecker. That was uh, pretty special. But don't, anyway, that tournament... 
Uh, I had found a spot that was a little creek that come into the main body of water just south of here. Um, Roach and, and those guys were 40, 50 miles downstream. There was all your leaders. Well, I had found this little creek um, where the, there was walleye spawning in there. They're all big females. And um, it was a heck of a thing to get into. Uh, I'd go under this little bridge. Now, this is just a stream. Goes into the main channel. I'd have to take the windshield off the boat and I'd push my boat up underneath this bridge and I'd get up in there by this beaver house. And it was, uh, it was every cast. They were all over. So in South Dakota at that time, you could have uh, per boat two overs, 18s, and the rest had to be between 15 and 18. There were only overs up in there. It was every cast. So I had gotten up in there day one and day two. Um, I can't remember exact position going out on day three. I was fourth or fifth, um, and the rest of the leaders were coming downstream where, where Roach and that was. Well, the wind had come up. That's how all those guys got stranded down. It got so rough, if you can imagine this, blowing downstream. You know, and, it, and that's Missouri, part of the Missouri River. So it's not super wide, but, I mean, it's windy, and they can, can't get back up. So I pulled into this place, into this creek that morning, I had a camera guy with me. and uh, <laughs> That's even worse. You get to document. Yeah, and I got the camera guy with me. because So every morning that I went in there, I made my four casts, got my four overs, and I was never particular. Well, that put me in fourth or fifth going into day three. So in day three, I go, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to be a little particular. I can win this tournament in this creek. But I had to come out and get my, my slot fish, which... Uh, they weren't as important. There was we could catch lots of fish, so I was confident I could get my slot fish. But the more important thing were the big overs that were up in that creek arm. So I'm going to be particular. I pull up to this this uh, creek and I I start up under there. I take the windshield off. I get the boat up under the bridge, and there's a little sandbar right in front of the bridge. Well, I nose that big lund up there, and I mean it's it stops dead. And I'm thinking, what the heck? Now, the wind's blowing downstream like crazy, and I'm thinking, what the heck? I go, ah, shit, I'll push the boat over it. So I coax my partner, amateur partner. We jumped out of the boat, and we physically pushed that big lun. I had a 20-foot lun at the, at the time. Pushed it over this little sandbar. I get over the sandbar. I get up to the beaver house. I tie up. I make a cast. I catch a fish. It's an over. And the camera guy happened to say something. He goes, is the water coming out of here, out of this creek? I'm thinking, what the hell is he talking about? So I turn around where I just tied up to this this uh, beaver house, beaver dam, and I'm looking where I tied <laughs> underwater, and it's showing. I mean, I've been in here 15 minutes, and I've lost another four inches of water, and I go, holy shit, I need to get out of here. I'll never get over that sandbar. So long story short, I get to the sandbar. We jump out to go to push over that lund is not going over. Here I am. I'm stuck. All right? I can't get out of this crick arm. So I sit there. I'm trying to figure out what the heck to do. I go, well, I mean, I can't get out of here. It is what it is. So I walk up to the highway, flag a guy down. He's going into town. I get in. <laughs> I go into town, and I go to the way in, and I'm staying in there, and, and you know, Roach, that, by that time, Roach had come back, so to go for on. That's when the took place that uh you know i took his fish up to the weighing for him well i'm standing there and a guy says you're todd frank in the crowd there i'm watching the weigh-in i go yeah i am he goes hey your boat down there in the creek i go it is he goes well how are you going to get it out i says well i'll just wait for the water wind to stop blowing what had happened is the wind blew so hard downstream it created a suction and it pulled the water out of this bay we got that going on in lake erie today actually yeah so uh and I wasn't aware that it did that in this crick arm. But the guy goes, so how are you going to get out of there? I go, I'll just wait till tomorrow. And I said, when that fills back up, I'll drive the boat out of there. He goes, well, just so you know, he says, I live right there. And when the water goes out of that bay, it could be three, four, five days before it comes back. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, that's not going to work. <laughs> I want to get out of here. So I get my truck, and I drive down there, and I'm standing there, and I'm studying in it. And I'm thinking, oh, man, if I could just get a tow truck. I think I could get out of here. So back into town I go. I get the phone book. Of course, we didn't have cell phones back then. I get the phone book. 
open up the towing. Johnny's towing, Pierre, South Dakota. I call up this guy. I go, listen, here's the scenario. I said, I'm down in this creek arm. I can't get out, but I think if I have a tow truck, you could hook onto my boat and uh, pull it up onto my spring. He goes, let me come down and see what you got going down there. <laughs> so he comes down and uh, he looks at it and he goes, yeah, he says, I think you can get, I think I can get you out of there. We got to go up, talk to the farmer. See How much if I money can... you got, boy? <laughs> <laughs> well, and he, th that's the next thing. I got no money, basically. <laughs> so he goes, we just got to go up to the farmer. We'll talk to the farmer, see if I can drive down that field. He says, well, get your, your suburban and trailer down. In the, if you can back that thing down in the cattails, he says, I can come right over top of you with my boom. And he says, you go out there and hook onto your boat. I'll pull your boat up into the trailer. And then he says, you're going to be stuck. And I'll just winch your suburban and trailer out. I go, okay, fine. So this is <laughs> I didn't think this was going to go this easy. <laughs> Well, so we didn't. get down to the farmer's mm -hmm. field. I take that suburban and trailer and I wedge it down through this cattail swamp. I got one shot to get it down in there, right? So I put this whole truck and trailer down in the swamp and he gives me this coil of cable. I go out there, hook it onto the, the bow eye, eye of that lund and he puts that wrecker right in front of my truck and he booms over my truck and he goes to bring the boat up on the trailer. Okay, fine. We finally, I mean, this is 10 o'clock at night now. Wayne is at 3, 4 o'clock. So he goes, uh, he gets my boat up on there. He goes to hook onto me and pull me out of the swamp. Well, he's stuck. And I'm thinking, oh, man. See, that's, I thought the story was the tow truck needed a tow truck. Oh, yeah. I go, oh, man. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm wondering, I'm thinking how much money I got in my pocket. It isn't much. And I'm thinking, this is going to be 500 This is going to be 1000 bucks to get out of here. And he goes, oh, don't worry about it. He says, I got a bigger wrecker. And he's, so he goes back and gets this tractor trailer size wrecker, comes back down there. This is 11 o'clock, midnight. At, no. <laughs> I've been messing with this thing for hours. He hooks on to his wrecker, pulls that out, hooks on to me, pulls my Suburban out, and I'm out finally. And I'm thinking, oh, the spill is going to be crazy. How am I going to pay this guy? I got no money. <laughs> so he gets all done, and he goes, uh, I go, how much? Oh, he goes, ah, 50 bucks. He said, it's not your fault I got stuck. Only in South Dakota, right? No <laughs> doubt. Bucks. Yeah, so I had, I don't know what I had in my pocket. I reached and I give them everything I had, just and I had enough money to get home. And um, anyway, I got out of that mess. Um, but that was that was one of the more memorable times that I had. Well, and you brought up a good point. You know, there's there's a lot of misconceptions in pro fishing. So we're going to back up a little bit from that. Is, yeah. you know, I mean, I obviously know your story a little bit. You know, we, we fished together quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned like, you know, what you had in your pocket. Neither one of us got a trust fund or started, you know, this was, and there are guys and we won't name names or anything. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we both know there's a lot of guys who own businesses and they were just there to play around. Right. And for me and you, I can remember when I very first met you, you know, like I said, I was, I was in my teens. I don't, like I said, driver's license literally. And uh, I can just remember you saying that, you know, you started your career like as a kid, you know, doing some guiding and, uh, and even before that cleaning bullheads. So Give us a little insight, you know, Todd Frank getting into fishing, you know, that, that fire that you got. Well, you know, I was, I got pretty fortunate on my first year. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember when I signed up for, for the PWT course to get in it at that time. Um, so how old were you then? How right. old was I? I think I was in my early 30s. And back then, to get into the PWT, there was 120 touring pros um, at that time. There was a waiting list to get in. You submitted an application. It went in front of the board of directors. You had to fish as an amateur prior to that. You had to have uh, pro sponsors that you had fished with. And when you submitted a resume, um, you know, they called all your references that you guys that you had fished with. They only took, when they took me in 1998 or 99, they took, Two people out of, I don't know how many applications they had, um, but they read your resumes. You know, of course, I fished the state stuff. That's how I built my resume and, and stuff up. But they took two people. Um, I was one of them. It was a major deal to get that letter. I remember getting that letter in the mail and saying that you were accepted to fish on um, the professional walleye trail um, uh, this next season. And... Um, 
I mean, it was such a big deal that the whole town threw me a party when I got that letter, that acceptance letter. Um, but it goes back to your question. I had no money. I had no sponsors. Oh, I had a couple of. Well, uh, let's little... let's back up even a little bit from there. Again, like I can remember sure. you telling me. Correct me when I'm wrong, but I, this 20 years ago you told me this or more. You know, like you started cleaning bullheads as a, as a young kid. You know, like I mean, <laughs> how how did you even make that jump to fishing? Because I remember you were, you know, what you tell me, but the New York uh, State Championship and stuff like that. Like let's let's go even before the PWT. Like so, people yeah. know how you get there. Prior to the PWT, of course, uh, I grew up on the Salmon River, and um, as a kid, all I wanted to do was fish. I mean, as my grandfather used to take me, I caught the bug early, early on. Um, I come from a fishing town in Pulaska, as you know, as a trout and salmon fishery. That's where I got my start. Um, and I grew up on, on the river itself. So that was, I was out in the country. That is what I did. I fished. Um, and so I've been in every aspect of it coming up through. So you know, I worked all the charter boats, and, and I was a stream guide and river guide and all of that. Um, walleye fishing around here wasn't popular at all. I mean, it was all trout and salmon. And I got I got on the walleye back in my uh, teens, I suppose, and we didn't know how to catch them. Nobody knew how to catch them, but nobody fished them. It was trout and salmon. All that warm water species of bass and perch and all that, panfish, they were all... We had really good fishing in all of those species, but um, it was never done here to any degree. So I had to teach myself how to catch them. Well, the more I fished for them, the more I couldn't catch them. The matter I got, the more time I spent at it. So, um, and, and there was no information highway like there is today no where you Google. can pull up a YouTube video and figure out how to jig fish or what have you. But so. That went on, and I got messing with these walleyes and um, to an obsession, really, in um, trying to figure out how to catch them, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I was sitting watching a NASCAR race one day, meeting a buddy of mine, and um, we opened up the uh, um, in Fisherman or Walleye Insider, and they were having a tournament up in a walleye tournament up in uh, on one of the bays here in Lake Ontario, over in the east. So, like Henderson Harbor thought, or something? Yeah, it was up. It was Black River Bay, but it's within sight of Henderson Harbor. And I go, geez, you know, we fish that all the time. We ought to get in that. And so we did. A uh, uh, buddy of mine by the name of Todd Miller and I, we, we got into that walleye tournament um, and fished against those guys. And we ended up second. We only missed first place by a smidge. It was it was a smidge. I mean, uh, you know, less than a two hundredths of a a pound it was ridiculous on a digital scale but that is where my actual tournament um fire came from after that i'd signed up for the whole it was a it was new york team walleye i signed up for the whole rest of the year and then i fished uh the next year but um i was dominant in that and and so the last six state tournaments i fished i think i won four of them took second in one and completely missed on one but um that was the fire that really got me going. So I, after that, I went out and fished uh, uh, PWT as the amateur. I wanted to see what these pros did different than I did. So, um, so I went out and I fished. Uh, it might have been ninety-seven or ninety-eight. A whole uh, tour of the PWT as an amateur, um, and then after that particular year is is when I submitted an application and uh, got accepted into the PWT. And I remember. Very first tournament, Detroit River. It was in March. It was early March or April. And I remember first day of practice. That was I a nasty, the motel nasty room. weather. And, and it's the rain and wind is blowing through the motel room as I opened up the door. And I'm thinking, oh, man, what have I done? <laughs> so I went out and I fished that tournament. Didn't know anybody. Didn't really have any sponsors. Fishing on my dime. And there was 120 guys in that tournament. I took 90th. And uh, I remember driving home that time from that tournament. I'm thinking, oh, boy, I might have bit, bit off a little bit more than I can chew. Uh, I had enough money to get to the next tournament, which is the Mobridge, South Dakota. I get to Mobridge, South Dakota. And uh, the wind started blowing. And it was real hard to practice. And I actually pre-fished from shore. 
I learned oh, this. I remember uh, that. There yeah. was a story Pretty Walleye Insider about that. Yeah, you, yeah, you, there was you a whole a story hook. on that. Um, yep. And I, I, you know, I pre-fished from shore uh, because it was funny because I learned this up on the Bay of Quinney. These big walleyes, you know, we were fishing in a boat out in front of this one spot that I ended up winning the Derby at, and we would catch, you know, we were doing a moving presentation, jig fishing or live bait rigging, um, and all we caught is the males. Well, I happened to see a couple of guys on shore fishing, and I watched every fish that they caught was all big ones. They caught no little ones. So the next day, the wind blew so hard we couldn't get on the water. I went down in there, went down there, put my car hard on, put my hat down, and I fished from shore. And the key was is those big females were tied to the bank, and uh, they didn't want anything moving. We fished with bait but you had to anchor it to the bottom. I sat there and I caught big walleye after big walleye. So it was funny because- I remember the, that. I, I the, remember that yeah. in the magazine. And the wind continued to blow, canceled the day one of the tournament, canceled day one, day two of the tournament. It turns into a one day deal. And uh, it blew so hard that whole bay, that little area that I was fishing was all mud and stuff. So I didn't know how it was gonna go down. So I went in there during the uh, day three of the tournament, I went right over there. I pulled right up to the bank. I double set anchors. It's three footers in here. Wind's still blowing. I anchored up and uh, and started bottom fishing and caught all my fish right there. And it was, here's, here's the best part of the whole story. I can remember calling home uh, a couple of days before the tournament started. And... Uh, my wife at the time goes, uh, how's it going? I go, well, it's not going very good. Um, she goes, why is that? I go, I don't think I have enough money to get home. And she goes, really? I go, yeah. And I don't have any room left on my credit cards. So she goes, well, what are you going to do? She goes, I go, I got to win. Or I got to get a check out of this You're like deal. a Lifetime movie, Frank. <laughs> this, is, this is tournament number two on the Fresh Walleye Trail. So... Long story short, I won that tournament, fifty-two thousand dollars, and uh, twenty years that, ago. What's that? Twenty years ago. Oh, it was more than that because I've been I've been off for twelve. Yeah, it was at least twenty. Twenty twenty-one. Yeah. Yeah, twenty twenty-one so years my, ago. My point is, is fifty-two grand back then. Well, fifty-two grand back then was a big deal, and uh, without that win, I didn't. I had to borrow money to get home. Number one. Um, I think I would have been done at that time. Um, so what that win did for me is is not only it got me through that year and another, um, it brought on a lot of recognition. It got me a lot of TV time. It got me sponsors. Most importantly, thing it got me sponsors. And that tournament right there is what excelled me to go on um, and um, was able to make a career out of it after that. So... Uh, that was a that was a sp pretty special tournament in Mobridge, South Dakota, for me. Well, I mean, it sounds like you kind of had a little bit of destiny. Obviously, you know, you helped make your own destiny. I mean, your power of observation there, because I do definitely, I would not have brought it up because uh, I wouldn't have remembered, but I do remember that now. About there was a picture in the magazine where you were all bundled up on shore, and they really uh, they were pumping that whole deal up. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's one thing when you get when you get pushed into a corner. Um, and, and you've got to perform to make it through. And I mean, it wasn't just that particular tournament. That's what got me through the rest of the years. But there were many times I'd go to a tournament and go, listen, you need to come out of here with a check. No ifs, ands, or buts. And, uh, uh, you dig deep, you know, you dig deep and, and, uh, and you make it happen. You, you official. You know, you pre-fish longer than everybody else, and and um, you just work harder at it. It makes you work harder. Well, and I, and I, I don't want to put anything on record too much that I'm going to regret saying, <laughs> but you, you, you did it the right way. There was guys that I saw through the years there that were in a similar situation, but they did it um, with not as many scruples. Yeah, it's uh, – and I look back on it now, and, and – um, um, it was an awesome time in my life. It really was. It was just a really awesome time in my life. But I have never worked harder at any one thing or any job 
Um, and every, and you always hear this, oh, I wished I was a fisherman. I wished I could do what you, you did. Um, you have no idea what kind of work and devotion and time and sacrifices that it takes to be uh, competitive in, in that field. Um, I hand it to, to all those guys. My hats are off. All those guys that are up there in the top all the time, you know, I know what it takes um, to do that, and it's a lot. It's, it's a lot at home. It's a lot when you're there. It's a lot when you're not there that you are mentally there, right? I mean, it's it's as much of the mental game as um, – is anything is 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 it is physical um you have to be in that mindset and i and i'm and for me i had to be in the mindset of fishing basically 24 7 uh when i was when i was on the tour when i was pre-fishing when i was home all i thought about was you know catching fish and these guys are good i mean when you get to this level um that's how these people that are success successful, that's how they do it. Um, and if you didn't, if you weren't like that, you weren't it's successful at it. And that's my opinion. And I think probably what helped you a little bit too is you were kind of at the beginning, again, where we both live in different areas, but we're on the Great Lakes and we kind of did, you know, do the same thing, is you were on the beginning edge of the trolling explosion. Offshore boards coming out, the snap weights, and, and you're salmon fishing again, not trying to put words in your mouth, but I know me and you have talked a lot privately yeah. with, we made our own dive charts and, and things, you know, we shared information on dive charts 20 plus years ago, and yeah. all of those things that, that a guy that was a jig fisherman from out west or in Minnesota, that they, they, you were already years ahead on that. Dipsy divers, I can remember you taking dipsy divers down to, was it Bull Shoals and almost? Yeah, Bull Shoals in Arkansas, yeah. Yeah, you know, and it was funny because when I got on the tour, that's what I knew. I come from a trout and salmon fishery, fishery, and and I was a troller in all aspects, whether it be lead core line or dipsy divers or downriggers or all of that. And I'll tell you another funny story: is I fished uh, when I fished as an amateur. I didn't know when I got on the tour. Get this: when I got on the tour, I didn't know jig fishing, I didn't know rig fishing, I didn't know slip bobber fishing. I learned that as I was going along on the tour. So I was fishing, it was, this is a funny quick story, I was fishing with Scott Fairbain up on uh, 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 Walker, Minnesota on Leech Lake. And uh, I remember getting in the boat and he goes, uh, uh, we're going to be rigging some leeches up on a shoal submarine, they call it. And, and uh, he goes, you can do that, right? I go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking to myself all the way out there, I go, I have no idea what he's talking about, rigging leeches? So we pull up there and, you know, and he hands me, it's, back then you had to, uh, the pro provided all the tackles, so he hands me this uh, slip sinker rig with a red hook on it, and, you know, I just kind of out of the corner of my eye, I kind of watch him how he's hooking this leech. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we start rigging these leeches across this shoal, and <laughs> he goes, uh, you never done this before? I go, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, he says, well, you got to do it this way. So... I learned as I went along how to do all this stuff. I could troll with the best of them, but uh, I had to learn all that other stuff. So I picked up, I picked up on it, and I got to be where you know I really love to jig fish and rig fish, um, and and still to this day, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm a trolling guy, and uh, but I like to do all that other stuff too for sure. So do you want to do you want to talk about? Because I think this is a pivotal thing in your life. But if you don't want to go there, I totally get it about your uh, accident in the in the garage. Yeah, that was. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that just, was just a, lay it out there. It, it was just another thing, you know. These are the cards that you get dealt through life. I guess is how you manage them and and what you do with it. Um, it would have been easy for me to give up at that point, but uh, in two thousand and four, I was involved in a propane explosion in my garage, and I lost everything. You know, I still get choked up today about it, but... Um. I mean, I can remember getting the, the picture <laughs> sent to me from Papa, and I was like, oh, my God. I mean, your face was like a basketball. It's just slits. I mean, you got yeah. what, shot how many feet in the air? Yeah, it was... Uh, you know, the whole garage exploded. I spent, uh, I spent over a month in the burn center um, down in Syracuse, and um, 
you know, it was quite a recovery after that. And a lot of skin grafting and in uh, all that stuff. Um, I had a lot of burns on my hands to where they, you know, they said they would never work again. Um, I lost every bit of fishing tackle, brand new Suburban. <laughs> you know, the garage was my office and it, everything I had was in there. So um, I can remember being in that hospital and, you know, the doctor would come up and he goes, I don't know if those hands are, are you know, you're going to get full mobility of those hands again. And I'm thinking to myself, this isn't going to work. I mean, I'm not, I'm not accepting that, you know, you go through physical therapy and they give you all these things to do. Um, and, you know, he says, you got to do this two hours out of every day. So, you know, you're going to get half mobility. So when he told me to do something for two hours a day, I did it for 10, you know, and, uh, I go, that's not an option for me. <laughs> you know, I need these hands to work. So, um, that was another hurdle and, uh, I fought and dug and, 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 you know, rebuilt, basically. Um, I had a lot of sponsors step up to the plate at that time because they knew I had lost everything. I laid in that hospital, and, and uh, uh, I had a person sitting there, and, you know, they're fanning through catalogs, and, and they made the contacts with the sponsors, and I ordered truckloads of stuff uh, as I sat there. So I was out of there and, and got myself you know, uh, healthy enough to get back on tour. I think that year I might have only missed one tournament. This happened in February, and I got was back on tour in April, I believe. Um, That's resilient. But yeah, just another, you know, them were the cards that I was dealt, and uh, I could have certainly rolled over at that point, um, but um, that wasn't an option for me. I just, um, so we dug in dude, deeper. You were, dude, you were in bad shape because me and you spent, if you remember, a lot of time together that summer. Yeah, because you went, you were pre-fishing long for those events, and me and you, guy, we stayed, we were fishing together. Because I was in, I was in college, or right about in that range, I don't remember exactly, but, at any rate, we fished a bunch, and we, yeah. were, well, there's all kind of shenanigans, which was another roach story if you remember when he kept <laughs> calling, and me and you, he's like, why aren't you guys on the water? Where are you at? Why is that noise in the background? Are you out there chasing? What are you doing? Yeah, we're like, oh, Papa, we're chasing something, all right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Those were uh, some interesting times, but uh, yeah, that the resilience to come back from that. I remember you you telling me or somebody, I think it was Roach maybe, that they said that probably one of the reasons you survived is that you uh, had training as a fireman and you rolled in the snow to keep the skin on your body. Yeah, yeah, I was definitely on fire when I come out of there, and it was it was fortunate that it was in February. We had snow on the ground. Uh, you're right. I had. Uh, I'd spent numerous years in the fire department at that time. So uh, there you go. You know, you can step back and say, you know, uh, had I not done that fire department thing for years, you know, that was, I was paid back for all the time I spent in the fire department at that moment. So, um, yeah, it's just, uh, is how your life unfolds and, and um, you never know what you're going to, you know, take and have to use the things that you've learned in order to survive basically so so you went on you fished still a number of years had a great career in there but um you know what do you really think the downfall of walleye fishing tournament stuff is and i know people probably gonna be mad that i even say that but it just isn't what it was i mean just like you said you had to have a resume you kind of had to have a like the bass fishing you had to have kind of a, yeah. a, a jump system and now it's mastercard and visa the money is it's right. literally less than it was 20 years ago yeah, when I, you know, and I, there's a number of things that um, I think uh, made the, the walleye fishing less popular. Um, and one of the things was is when they come out with multiple tournament trails, uh, you're right. If you had a pulse in $1,500, you're a professional fisherman. It wasn't like that years ago. Um, you earned your way in. Um, um, through resumes and fishing local tournaments and that thing that way there um the guys the names back in in those days had some meaning to them and, I, and it's not a it's not that the guys that that are around today don't have that um but but the guys back then you know come up through the ranks and they were fouled as they were young uh through tv and media 
um, and they were household names, much like the Bass. The Bass has still done that and to a certain degree. You still have those big household names. But um, when they opened the circuits up to multiple tournaments, um, pro, what they call pro tournaments, I think that's where it started to take a turn. They needed to fill these fields. Um, you know, there was 120, 150 of us that was, was basically full-time and around all the time. But they now they needed 300. So um, a lot of good people come from that, too. Don't get me wrong. But that's where it started. Um, I think where it started going down is, is uh, with no question, when the gas uh, in 2007 went to, I can remember, it was 225 a gallon. It pulled into Sault Ste. Marie, and I'm thinking, oh, we're done. $2.25 a gallon, filling up a boat, filling up the Suburban. I go, we're done. And, um, you know, that right there hit the marine industry really, really hard. we never seen anything like that, $2.25 in gas. Uh, and so it got, and th- it obviously got worse for a while there. Well, and it, and it got much worse after that. So, But that was the start of it. So what happened when that happened, there was a lot of sponsorship in the marine industry um and when when those companies start pulling back you know you can start seeing these guys there it was never super lucrative anyway but when you start seeing those sponsors pull back we started losing guys um and that was the real start of it well 2008 and the economy tanks right um so back to back years the economy starts tanking more companies more of those bigger companies um start to pull back and when, when you do that, the sponsorships go away, some of the TV goes away, some of the media goes away, um, and it never fully recovered after that. That is when I, I left and, uh, and uh, entered the working world again. Um, I, I had enough money at that time, and I was established enough to go um, for a couple of years and not make any money. Um, but I was worried. I was offered a job, um, the rep job that I have now. I was offered a job in that 2008 um, year th- towards the end of it. And uh, I go, boy, I could make it a couple of more years in this game. But then what happens if it doesn't come back? And uh, so I took the rep job. And um, and it was, it was the best decision that I think that I had ever made probably. Um, did it come back? It did. Once the economy come back around, it come back, but I, I still don't know that it's, it's like it was back in those days, you know, in the older days when it was, uh, um, you know, it was walleye fishing all over the place. We had walleye insider, we had lots of TV coverage, um, you know, and it was growing. It wasn't bass by any means, but, um, it was definitely growing leaps and bounds, um, until that time. So, I mean, here, here's a million dollar question that probably didn't see coming. If you know, like kind of how major league fishing hit the bass stuff, and it, it kind of changed things. Now you can we won't get into that debate if it's better or worse because that was a whole nightmare, yeah. right? But if yeah. something like that came out and they said, "Hey, Todd Frank, we're going to get the band back together. Um, we want you to come back and fish these things. You know, we want the, we're going to have a resume, and, we're, and everybody there is going to be somebody." Could you see yourself getting back in if the prize was? I don't think so. Um, I, in a, in a, not that. Not that I didn't like it, not that I didn't love it, um, not that I didn't live it. Um, there's been 12 years transpired since I was in that. A lot of things have happened. Um, I'm not I'm not in my 30s anymore, early 40s. Um, I know what kind of time and effort it took to be competitive. Um, and, you know, I know what kind of life I have now. Um, I look at it as I spent a lot of a lot of years um, on the tour and was successful at it. Had a good career. Um, I left at my peak, um, but to go back and and do it again and put that much time and put that much effort, you can have all the knowledge you want, but you still need to put all the time, all the effort. Get beat up by the weather, you know, all of the above. And I'm not I'm not in my thirties anymore, you know. So, um, to go dabble in it a little bit, throw a tournament in here, throw a tournament in there, eh, maybe, but probably. You're not a guy that dabbles because you want to do good. 
Yeah, you know, and, and I have people ask me all the time, and, and, and this has come up, why don't you fish any local tournaments anymore? And I always tell people, it's a no-win situation. I can't win this, right? I can go and fish a local tournament, and I'm going down there. I'm not going down there to play. If I go to fish a local tournament, I'm going to win. So I go down there, and I win the tournament, say. Um, oh, I'm a smuck because I won the tournament. I go down there, don't put the time in, don't win the tournament. Oh, I'm a smuck because I should have won the tournament. So <laughs> for me, it's just... Uh, it's it's a damned no win. If you do, situation. damned if you don't. It it really is, and you know, back in the back in the day when I first started this, I had something to prove to myself. I wanted to prove that I could compete with the best walleye fishermen in the country. Um, I did that. I don't need to prove myself anymore, you know. And uh, so I'm going to leave it as it is. <laughs> and uh, maybe someday when I retire. I'll get a grandkid or something that, that wants to go dabble in that stuff and maybe I'll introduce them at that point. I, I kind of figured you'd say that. I think, you know, part of it's the pocket, yeah. part of it's the back, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. the, and the body. Um, yeah. It's just, it's a, it's a chapter in your deal, you know. It is, it is. And, you know, um, had the economy not tanked at that point, I don't know where we would be at this time. I guess it's been about 11 years since I retired. Um, I never thought that, that I would leave the tournament game. I figured that I could do a, be a Gary Roach um, and just continue down that path until I was ready to retire. That's that's how I thought it was going to play out. Um, and and had the economy not tanked and all that, I I still think. Um, but it had to be lucrative. Don't get me wrong. It's got to be lucrative. Um, I watched Gary do it in his sixties. Um, he's a freak I, though. I think I could have, but to leave it and then come back and get in that again, I, I just don't know if I want to do that. Yeah, I get that. And you know, and, and the rep thing is good for you. And I can remember several companies, you know, no way that they knew that I know you say, Hey, we know we got a good rep and you know, these people all talk, Hey, this guy's a schmuck or he don't even know what this is. And yeah, I can remember the first time uh, I was actually in meetings at fish USA and I come walking down the, the hallway. Do you remember that? <laughs> Yeah, I do. And you were there, and the owner and, and the Presidente and all the guys are there, and I said, oh, that guy looks like a schmuck, and everybody just stopped. Or, I think I used stronger language than that, truthfully, too. <laughs> and everybody just stopped in there, and I think Doug was the only one that knew, you know, that I knew you, and they were like, man, you know this guy? I'm like, yeah, he looks like a shitty rep to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, all that, all that knowledge that you have that you can just handle in a better way than when you're 25, you know, because you've been there, done that. And right. I, don't, I don't even know if it's maybe street cred with some guys, but I think it's just knowing the ins and outs of stuff, just the whole workings. Yeah, when, uh, when I was offered a rep job, and um, I, didn't think of, I didn't even think of being a rep. Um, Northland Tackle, which was a sponsor of mine since the beginning, they uh, had hired a new group at the time, uh, rep group. They were getting ready to hire a new rep group. And they uh, uh, they needed a guy over in the Northeast, always have needed a guy over in the Northeast. So when when they knew they were hiring a new group, uh, they said, you know, told the group that they need to hire a guy in the Northeast. And they called me up and they go, would you be interested in this? couple years prior to that Lund did a similar thing they was looking for a rep in uh, uh, the Northeast the guy was retiring um, I had been with Lund boats for for all my career and um, and had some sales background I was sales manager I sold snowmobiles ATVs and watercraft for a number of years um, and at that time I go eh, I'm really not interested um, you know I was at the top of my career things were going good um, and then, and then, you know, fast forward two years and I watched the circuit, I watched the guys, we were losing guys and I was offered a rep job again. And, you know, I go, you know, maybe I hadn't ought to let this go by. So I took it and it was the perfect job for me. It really is. You know, I've all my life, all I've ever done was fish. Um, so when you're repping these products and you get to go in and talk with buyers, especially when you get to a fish USA, these buyers are fishermen that, you know, um, they're easy to talk to. And, um, you know, being from fishing all your life, 
it's easy. It's it's really easy. You've been through every scenario. You know what works, what there's doesn't work. There's nothing forced. You just know there's it. You don't have to study. Forced. There's there's nothing fake. Like if I tell a buyer, um, you know, you need to have this, um, these particular colors, these sizes, blah blah blah. Um, that's talking with experience that I've gained over the years. Um, and I can talk with confidence in it. It's not like, oh, you got to have this as the next best, best thing. This is a banjo minnow to catch fish in a mud puddle. Um, buyers, a lot of buyers can see right through that. So this job fit me perfect. Um, I happen to land with an, just an amazing rep group. I work for uh, Rasset Outdoor Group out in, um, they're based out of Minnesota. I cover the Northeast for them. Um, we've got basically 10, 11 people in our group. Um, that was another thing that come down the pipe. I couldn't have gotten with a better rep group. They have been fantastic to work with. There was a, they're a super bunch of uh, uh, good guys. They know fishing like I know fishing. Um, and the whole group is like that. So it was, uh, it was a really nice, easy transition um, into that world. Uh, it was funny because when I got into it, you know, Back when I was working, we did fax machines. <laughs> I entered the workforce 12, 13 years later, and I, oh yeah, I had a computer. I didn't know what it was for, but I had one. I didn't know what an email was. I had to learn all that stuff. I can remember when Joe Rassa hired me. He goes, and I don't know if I've ever told him this or not. And he goes, "You know how to work a computer and do emails and stuff like that?" I go, "Oh yeah, yeah, I got, I got all that." Just, well, just like, hey, just like you, Riggin. <laughs> I had no idea, but I figured it out. You know, you figure it out. Uh, that's, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of yeah. life. That's what they say. You, you Don't say no, figure out how to do it. Yeah, just figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Well, you definitely got a little more gray than you had back when I met you. you probably caught I, a few more fish too, but. I suppose, I suppose. <laughs> so, so what would you like to leave us with? Something that Todd Frank's thought of the day. I mean, you haven't thrown me under the bus yet, which I'm just. I was waiting for that, to be honest with you. Well, I'm being good to you. I'm being good to you. You know, it's, uh, I have I have some respect for you too, Ross Aroni. Not much, but I got some. <laughs> hey, am I still <laughs> saved in your phone as the same thing? That's all Ross. <laughs> and, 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 what, and what did I tell you? Just because you wanted it, it me to be, A, I'm ahead of your mom and your calendar in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm going to give you some credit because um, you figured out a way to make a living in the fishing business. Um, that's all I'd ever wanted to do my whole life. I've done several different things. But um, there's uh, there's a lot of worse ways you could be making a living, that's for sure. And so I'm going to give you credit for being able to do it and be successful at it. And, you know, when we get up every day... Um, I love my job. You know, you love your job. That means the world, um, I think, to a person's well-being, a person's attitude. Um, just when you get up in the morning, you go, I really like my job. Um, I think that means all the difference in yeah, the you, world. You don't do this to make a ton of money, but you, yeah. you're not clocking in a factory. I mean, yesterday, you know, again, yeah. I'm not looking for, for sympathy from anybody, but we, you know, fished about 12, 13 hours, you know, total time of about 16 hour a day that yeah. wears on you you know what i mean today we're shooting these all day and people don't yeah. realize they oh, i want to be a fisherman they want to wear a shirt with stickers and stuff on it and it's like yeah that's not what this is about and and the guys that are in that don't last long um and yeah me, me and you really have had pretty similar careers from the standpoint of counting how we've done things i mean i think you know you being in new york me being in ohio it's, it's i think you'd agree with this right yeah. If, if I lived or if you lived in Minnesota, Wisconsin, I don't know that we would have been able to do it unless maybe, you know, winning that tournaments, things like that, because it's right. so saturated where there's very few people that have jumped on the determination train, if you will, in our right. neck of the woods of walleye world. We're kind of on that outer edge. And yeah. it just there wasn't that many guys that were going to step up and take the torch. Yeah, um, absolutely. A hundred percent correct in that. I think, Ross, um, one thing that I did learn a long time ago, um, and everybody has different hobbies and different interests. Um, I learned a long time ago, it wasn't all about the money. Um, I've always been, I've always had enough money to do whatever I wanted to do. Um, that was by design. 
um, you know, if I didn't have enough money with one job, I'd have two jobs, that type of thing. Um, but what was always the most important to me is that I was happy doing whatever I'm doing. I want to be able to do what I want when I want. Um, and for basically, I'm going to say 20, I move going on 25 years now. I've done what I wanted when I wanted to do it, basically. Um, get rich at it? No. But make a decent living? Absolutely. So you get people that are, their goal is to make money. Um, they want to be rich and they want to do this. And they want to, that was never my goal. Rich, rich comes be, in, rich, I'm, I'm just about old enough to understand this. Rich comes in different forms. Absolutely. You know, I, I know a lot of guys, you know, they work in, in no disrespect to whatever job that is, whether it's an auto plant or a CEO or something. And, yep. you know, they're counting their bucks and then they turn around and they fall over dead or they, they live for Saturdays and Sundays. And I don't think me and you have ever lived for a Saturday and Sunday. I mean, no. And that wasn't, and that wasn't, and that's not my cup of tea. But like I say, no disrespect to somebody that, that, that is their interest and that's the way they want to live their life. That wasn't me. I wanted to fish. That's what I knew. I wanted to fish and I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And, and, uh, I've got about seven years left and, uh, I'm almost there. So maybe you'll take me fishing again. We're close. I might have yeah. to take you then in a wheelchair or something in seven years. I don't know. Well, maybe I'll take you fishing, but probably not. I don't think I want to take you either. I think I think my tour of duty's done. My <laughs> goodwill's over. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave people at home with this. You know, you're sitting there, and I've been I've been staring at your garage there. You know, and me and you are we're tackle horse. We're we're we we just we hoard this stuff, right? And I'm looking at the bottom of how many rods and crankbaits and stuff. <laughs> and you already told me when we were sitting here trying to get this set up, Smith and Wesson was my. De- might de- going to deter me, but uh, if anybody's uh, watching this, uh, definitely, uh, or listening to it, you should need to go watch it on YouTube, and you can see all Todd Frank's tackle there, and uh, a little <laughs> bit of tackle garage envy, right? Remember this, he who dies with most stuff wins. <laughs> as long as it's crankbaits, right? <laughs> well, I want to thank you for taking the time to, to join us, and uh, we will definitely have to... Um, I think when we do go fishing again together, there may be some fish cut, but I think there's going to be probably more ball bust than anything. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure that will be the case. From one tall, skinny guy to another. Sounds good. We're out. Thanks, Ross. We'll see you, buddy. Thanks for joining us at the Big Water Podcast. To hear the shenanigans, look at all the old episodes that we've done. Check us out at YouTube, bigwaterfishing.com, and, of course, follow us at Instagram and Facebook. Big Water Fishing. Let's go.